Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Circle Opens, a podcast devoted to a chapter-by-chapter review of Stephen King's The Stand. Do you need an affordable source for Stephen King books, movies, collectibles, and more? Make sure to visit Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Listeners of this podcast can use the coupon code The Circle for 20% off their order anytime, and there's always free shipping to the United States. That's Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sarah, and thank you for joining me this week on our journey through the stand. As always, I hope everyone is doing well. I hope you're all healthy, and I hope you're all staying safe. Before we jump into chapters 59 and 60, I just want to say a quick thank you to all of my listeners, especially those who have reached out to me either on social media or email, um, either to talk about the stand, the podcast, or just Stephen King in general. It's really great to get those emails. I truly do appreciate every single one that I get. If you are enjoying the podcast, you can leave me a rating review at Apple Podcasts. The reviews certainly help the podcast get noticed a bit more, and they really do make my day. You've all been really great. Thank you so much to everybody who has already left me a review. You guys really don't know how much it means to me. The podcast itself takes a lot of time and effort (laughs) on my part, and it really does mean a lot that there are people out there who are listening and enjoying it. So thank you guys so much. You guys are amazing. If you do want to get in touch with me, you can reach me at thecirclecloses at gmail.com or on social media at The Circle Opens, or you can go to the blog, thecircleopens.com, and leave a comment or use the form there to get in touch with me. And with that said, we are going to jump into chapters 59 and 60. I decided to combine the two chapters because chapter 60 is essentially a page and a half to two pages long, depending on what book you're reading or the Kindle book. So I've merged those two chapters into this episode. So let's just go ahead and recap chapter 58 from last week. Fran and Larry took Harold's ledger to Stu. All three of them decide that exiling Nadine and Harold would probably be the best way to deal with the issue, but they decide to wait and talk to the committee the next night about how to handle the situation. Harold and Nadine, however, have already left by then. They are camping out at Sunrise Amphitheater, waiting for the evening of September 2nd. At the committee meeting, they let Brad Kitchener and Chad Morris talk about the power and the burial committee. They know now that Harold and Nadine have already left, and while Fran worries about what will happen to Harold now, she is grateful that he's left them in peace. Soon, however, she feels a premonition that something bad is about to happen and that they all need to leave the house at once. At the same time, they can hear motorcycle engines outside on the road, and the majority of the people inside Ralph's house go outside to see what the commotion is all about. Mother Abigail is back, and she's in bad shape. George Richardson, the doctor, takes off to see her. In the chaos, Nick also seems to realize that something is in the house. He gets Fran to leave and runs to the closet where Nadine had planted the dynamite bomb. As Fran is trying to get Stu to get Nick out of the house, the bomb explodes, sending Fran flying into the backyard. Something lands on her soon after, and she falls unconscious. Chapter 59. When Fran begins to stir, she can hear birds. As memories of the explosion come back to her, she wakes up and realizes that she's in a hospital bed. Stu is there with her, a bandage wrapped over one forearm with a nasty-looking cut on his cheek. Part of his hair has been burned away, but he's alive. She immediately asks about the baby, and Stu reassures her that she has not lost it. Fran begins to cry, and they hold each other. Soon after, Stu explains that there are seven dead from the blast, Nick being one of them. They had to use certain scars from his body to identify him. Sue Stern and Chad Norris also died in the blast as they had been inside the house when the bomb exploded. The other four dead were Andrea Terminello, Dean Wyckoff, Dale Peterson, and Patsy Stone. They had all come up from town on the motorcycles. Patsy had been teaching Leo how to play the flute. Twenty more were wounded in the blast, including Teddy Wiesak, who had no chance to recover. 
Ralph lost his third and fourth fingers on his left hand. Fran ended up with whiplash, a sprained back, and a broken foot. The sprained back and broken foot happened when a couch landed on her in the backyard. Stu had pulled the couch off of her, so crazed that he punched Larry in the mouth when he came to help him. Stu confirms that it was Harold and Nadine Cross. They had hurt them, but they didn't do the damage that they had probably wanted to do. There were people searching the hills for them already, but Stu didn't think that they'd be found. Harold was probably smart enough to get them far enough away from Boulder by daybreak. Stu explains to Fran that they had used an explosive hooked up to a walkie-talkie. And Fran realizes now that she and Larry had seen the evidence of it in Harold's basement, but they hadn't put it all together. Of course, she harbors guilt over that. If they had searched the whole house, maybe they would have found the bomb, and Nick and Susan would still be alive. But Stu rightly says that there's no way anyone could have been able to make out what was going on from a few snips of wire in an empty box. Not to mention the fact that while Larry and Fran were in, you know, Harold and Nadine's house, Nadine was at Ralph's house already planting the bomb. Fran begins to realize that Mother Abigail's return had saved lives. If she hadn't come back when she did, they would have all been in the house when the bomb went off. But is Mother Abigail dead? Stu says she came back into town around a quarter of eight. Larry Underwood's boy was leading her by the hand. He lost all his words. You know how he does that when he gets excited. But he took her to Lucy. Then she just collapsed. My God, how she ever walked as far as she did and what she can have been eating or doing. I'll tell you something, Fran. There's more in the world and out of it than I ever dreamed of back in Arnett. I think that woman is from God. Or was. However, she's not dead yet. Doc Richardson thinks that she will go soon. And Stu says, I'm afraid. She saved our lives by coming back, but I'm afraid of her. And I'm afraid of why she came back. Fran is confused because she doesn't think Mother Abigail would ever hurt them. But Stu points out that Mother Abigail does what her God tells her to do. That's the same God murdered his own boy, or so I heard. Fran is a bit appalled at this, and Stu backs down. But now with Mother Abigail back and Nick dead, people in town are talking about him now. Flag. They know Harold set off the bomb, and they think Flag made him do it. They think Flag is responsible for Mother Abigail's condition now, too. But Stu is scared. Like it's all going to end badly, and he's never felt that way before. Near dusk on September 3rd, people begin to gather on the street outside of Larry and Lucy's home, where Mother Abigail is laid up in a bed inside. Larry watched them from the bedroom window. Behind him, in his and Lucy's bed, Mother Abigail lay unconscious. The dry, sickly smell coming from her filled his nose and made him want to puke. He hated to puke, but he wouldn't move. This was his penance for escaping while Nick and Susan died. He heard low voices behind him, the death watch around her bed. George would be leaving for the hospital shortly to check on his other patients. There were only 16 now. Three had been released, and Teddy Wiesak had died. Larry himself had been totally unhurt. Same old Larry keeps his head while others around him are losing theirs. The blast had thrown him across the driveway and into a flower bed, but he had not sustained a single scratch. Jagged shrapnel had rained down all around him, but nothing had touched him. Nick had died, Susan had died, and he had been unhurt. Yeah, same old Larry Underwood. And that's where his thoughts turned to Harold. Harold. He had followed Harold all the way across the country and followed a trail of payday candy wrappers and clever improvisations. Larry had almost lost his fingers getting gas back in Wells. Harold had simply found the plug vent and used a siphon. Harold was the one who had suggested the memberships in the various committees slide upward with population. Harold, who had suggested that the ad hoc committee be accepted in toto. Clever Harold. Harold and his ledger. Harold and his grin. Flag had always been there, in the background, a puppet master. And he thinks about Nadine how she had tried to beg him to have her, and he had turned her away. How could he have said yes? There was his responsibility to Lucy, 
that had been all important, not just because of her, but because of himself. He sensed it would take only one or two more fades to destroy him as a man for good, so he had sent her away, and he supposed Flagg was well pleased with that previous night's work, if Flagg was really his name. Oh, Stu was still alive, and he spoke for the committee. He was the mouth that Nick could never use. Glenn was alive, and Larry supposed he was the point man of the committee's mind, but Nick had been the heart of the committee, and Sue, along with Franny, had served as its moral conscience. Yes, he thought bitterly, all in all, a good evening's work for that bastard. He ought to reward Harold and Nadine well when they got over there. Richardson still had no idea when Mother Abigail would go, or if she would even live through the night. The woman on the bed was a skeleton covered with thinly stretched ash-gray skin. She seemed without sex. Most of her hair was gone, her breasts were gone. Her mouth hung unhinged and her breath rasped through it harshly. To Larry, she looked like the pictures he had seen of the Yucatan mummies. Not decayed, but shriveled, cured, dry, ageless. Yes, that's what she was now. Not a mother, but a mummy. There was only that harsh sigh of her respiration, like a light breeze through hay stubble. How could she still be alive? And what god would put her through it? To what purpose? It had to be a joke, a big cosmic horse laugh. George said he had heard of similar cases, but never one so extreme, and he himself had never expected to see one. She was somehow eating herself. Her body had kept running long after it should have succumbed to malnutrition. She was breaking down parts of herself for nourishment that had never been meant to be broken down. Lucy, who had lifted her onto the bed, had told him in a low, marveling voice that she had seemed to weigh no more than a child's box kite, a thing only waiting for a puff of wind to blow it away forever. Richardson, Lori, and Dick Ellis need to check on the patients in the hospital, so they leave Lucy and Larry with Mother Abigail. Lucy hugs Larry, who breaks down in her arms. The people gathered outside do not go home, even as darkness settles in. They talk about Mother Abigail if she's brain dead, if she'll recover. They talk about the dark man. And if Mother Abigail dies, does that mean the dark man is stronger? Is he Satan, the Antichrist? They begin to talk about their dreams, the one they had after the plague, the ones that led them to Boulder, their dreams of the dark man. And now they're worried about Flag. Does he have bombs, planes? Around 10 p.m., Stu, Glenn, and Ralph come by and pass out flyers, announcing a meeting the next evening. That seemed to be the signal to leave. All of them went home to get what sleep they could, perchance to dream. The next night in the auditorium, Stu chairs the meeting with Larry, Ralph, and Glenn. Fran is still in too much pain to attend, so they patch her through with a walkie-talkie. There are a few things to talk about before getting to the subject of the explosion. Brad Kitchener announces that they're going to switch on the power the next day, September 5th. This harbors a lot of applause and excitement. Brad simply explains what precautions need to be taken, and there's still a lot to be done. They'll have to turn on some power stations in Denver before the next year is done, but someone interrupts him and yells out, not if that hard case gets his way. Brad recovers quickly and says his business is power. He also says that, I think we'll be here long after that other guy's dead and gone. If I didn't think that, I'd be wrapping motors over on his side. Who gives a shit for him? Stu begins to announce the next item on the agenda, but a woman does not want to hear about the agenda. She yells out that she wants to talk about flag. The place erupts and Stu calls to order the meeting again. And he decides to talk about the explosion at Ralph's house. He explains that they found the dynamite bomb attached to a walkie-talkie. Then they found the other walkie-talkie up at the Sunrise Amphitheater. He assumes it was set off there, and no one is buying assumptions. They all know it was Harold and Nadine. As an uneasy murmur runs through the room, Stu thinks to himself, These are the good guys? They don't give a shit about Nick and Sue and Chad and the rest. They're like a lynch mob, and all they care about is catching Harold and Nadine and hanging them like a charm against the dark man. Stu catches Glenn's eye and Glenn offered him a very small, very cynical shrug. 
Stu points out that if they don't keep to the rules, then who are they? They have pretty convincing evidence that it was Harold and Nadine, and if they happen to wander back into the zone, that they're to be brought to Stu, where they will be locked up and tried. He says, we're supposed to be the good guys here. I guess we know where the bad guys are. And being the good guys means we have to be civilized about this. Yes, Stu thinks that they're the ones who did it, but punishment has to be done right. Next, Stu supposes they need to discuss filling the committee back up to strength. It's not something that they plan on doing that night, but they want people to start thinking about who should be on the committee. Someone immediately nominates Ted Frampton. Another seconds it. Ted Frampton clasped his hands and shook them over his head to scattered applause. And Stu felt that despairing, disoriented feeling sweep over him again. They were supposed to replace Nick Andros with Ted Frampton. It was like one of those sick jokes. Ted had tried the power committee and found it too much like work. He had drifted over to the burial committee, and that seemed to suit him better. Although Chad had mentioned to Stu that Ted was one of those fellows who seemed to be able to stretch a coffee break into a lunch hour and a lunch hour into a half-day vacation. He had been quick to join yesterday's hunt for Harold and Nadine, probably because it offered a change. He and Bill Scanlon had stumbled on the walkie-talkie up at sunrise through sheer luck. And to give Ted his due, he had admitted that. But since the find, he had acquired a swagger that Stu didn't like at all. Now Stu caught Glenn's eyes again and could almost read Glenn's thought in the cynical look there, the slight tuck in the corner of Glenn's mouth. Maybe we could use Harold to stack this one, too. Stu asks the crowd if they want to elect two new reps that night. Based on the eyes and the days, it's decided that they'll plan to meet a week from tonight to nominate and vote on the candidates for the two empty slots on the committee. With that ended, Stu thinks to himself, pretty crappy epitaph, Nick. I'm sorry. Richardson gets up to discuss Mother Abigail. He explains that there's nothing he can do for her. He discusses her prognosis, her condition. He says, I am told by members of the zone who were here before she left that the lady claimed 108 years. I can't vouch for that, but I can say she's the oldest human being I myself have ever seen and treated. I'm told she has been gone for two weeks, in my estimation, no my guess, is that her diet during that period contained no prepared foods at all. She seems to have lived on roots, herbs, grass, and other things of a similar nature. She has had one small bowel movement since she returned. It contained a number of small sticks and twigs. One arm is covered with poison ivy. Her legs are covered with ulcerations. And Richardson is then interrupted about, you know, decency. But Richardson points out that decency is not his concern. He's only reporting her condition as it is, and she's comatose and malnourished. And most of all, she is very, very old. Richardson thinks she's going to die, and he could say that with a certainty. But like everyone else, Richardson has dreamed of her, her and the other guy. He says, to me, dreams of such opposing configurations seem mystical. The fact that we all shared them seems to indicate a telepathic ability, at the very least. But I pass on parapsychology and theology just as I pass on decency. And for the same reason, neither of them is my field. If the woman is from God, he may choose to heal her. I cannot. I will tell you that the fact that she is still alive at all seems a miracle of sorts to me. And that is my statement. Are there any questions? There aren't. So next, Glenn gets up to discuss Randall Flagg. This is what everyone's waiting for. And Glenn explains that this man's name seems to be Randall Flagg, although some people have associated the names Richard Fry, Robert Fremont, and Richard Fremantle with him. The initials RF may have some significance, but if so, none of us on the Free Zone Committee know what it is. His presence, at least in dreams, produces feelings of dread, disquiet, terror, horror. In case after case, the physical feeling associated with him is one of coldness. He explains that Flag is out west, where they're crucifying people who will step out of line. There seems to be a confrontation shaping up between the man and themselves, and Flag will stick at nothing to bring them down. It could be armored force, nuclear weapons, the plague. Rich Moffat shrieks out, I'd like to catch hold of that dirty bastard. I'd give him a dose of the ever-fucking plague. There was a tension-relieving burst of laughter, and Rich got a hand. 
Glenn grinned easily. He had given Rich his cue and his line half hour before the meeting, and Rich had delivered admirably. Old Baldy had been right as rain about one thing, Stu was discovering. A background in sociology often came in handy at large meetings. Glenn believes that they need to deal with Harold and Nadine in a civilized manner if they're caught. But he thinks that they did this on Flag's orders. The dark man has to be dealt with. He says, I think that dying old woman somehow represents the forces of good as much as Flag represents the forces of evil. I don't think that power intends to forsake us now. Maybe we need to talk it over and let some air into those nightmares. Maybe we need to begin deciding what we're going to do about him. But he can't just walk into the zone next spring and take over. Not a few people are standing watch. And so they all spoke for nearly three hours. No good advice came from it. Wild suggestions, yes, but few practical ideas. During the last hour, they all begin to share their dreams of the dark man. Glenn is both amazed and heartened by their growing willingness to talk. They talk like people, he thought, who had kept the huddled up secrets of their guilts and inadequacies to themselves for a long time, only to discover that these things, when verbalized, were only life-sized after all. When the inner terror sowed in sleep was finally harvested in this marathon public discussion, the terror became more manageable, perhaps even conquerable. The meeting broke up at 1.30 in the morning, and Glenn left it with Stu, feeling good for the first time since Nick's death. He left feeling they had gone the first hard steps out of themselves and toward whatever battleground there would be. He felt hope. On September 5th, as promised, the power goes on at noon. There are a few things to take care of, a small electrical fire, a manhole cover being blown off, and there is a single fatality. Rich Moffat was sitting in a doorway across the street with a bottle of Jack Daniels in his newsboy's pouch, and a flying piece of corrugated steel siding struck him and killed him instantly. He would break no more plate glass windows. Stu is with Fran in the hospital when the power comes back on. Fran cries because Nick should have been alive to see this. And Stu, he suddenly found himself missing Nick very much and hating Harold Louder more than he ever had before. Fran was right. Harold had not just killed Nick and Sue. He had stolen their light. Around 3 a.m. the next morning, Glenn wakes Stu up from his slumber. He and Kojak are there to tell Stu that Mother Abigail is awake. She wants them, the five remaining committee members. Mother Abigail knew Nick and Susan were dead, and she knew Fran was in the hospital. Glenn says she's dying, and she says she has something to tell us and I don't know if I want to hear it. They drive to Larry's house, where Ralph shows up with Fran. Larry explains that he was in the room with Mother Abigail, dozing in and out, and when he woke up, she was looking at Larry. She couldn't talk above a whisper, but he could understand her. Mother Abigail told Larry that the Lord was going to take her home at sunrise, and she had to talk to those who God hadn't taken first. So the five of them, with Lucy, go upstairs to where Mother Abigail is waiting. Mother Abigail knows, just by looking at her, that Fran is pregnant and in pain. She tells her to sit. She tells Fran to look out the window. Fran turned her face to the window, where Larry had stood and looked out at the gathered people two days before. She saw not pressing darkness, but a quiet light. It was not a reflection of the room. It was morning light. She was looking at the faint, slightly distorted reflection of a bright nursery with ruffled checked curtains. There was a crib, but it was empty. There was a playpen, empty. A mobile of bright plastic butterflies moved only by the wind. Dread clapped its cold hands around her heart. The others saw it on her face, but did not understand it. They saw nothing through the window, but a section of lawn lit by a streetlight. Fran asks where's the baby, but Mother Abigail says the baby's life is in Stu's hands. The boy will have four fathers if God lets him draw breath at all. The imp has called his bride, and he intends to put her with child. Will he let Fran's child live? Mother Abigail tells them all, Electric lights ain't the answer, Stu Redman. CB radio ain't it either, Ralph Brentner. Sociology won't end it, Glenn Bateman. And you doing penance for a life that's long since a closed book won't stop it from coming, Larry Underwood. And your boy child won't stop it either, Fran Goldsmith. 
the bad moon has risen. You propose nothing in the sight of God. She looked at each of them in turn. God will dispose as he sees fit. You are not the potter, but the potter's clay. Mayhap the man in the west is the wheel on which you will be broken. I am not allowed to know. Mother Abigail asks them all to draw near. God had not brought them together to make a committee or a community, but to send them further on a quest. They're meant to destroy the dark prince. Mother Abigail had thought it would be Nick leading them, but God had taken Nick already. So it was Stu who would lead. If Stu fell, Larry. And if Larry fell, Ralph. Fran asks, lead where? And Mother Abigail says, west. Fran is not to go, only the four men. And of course, Fran is angry. Fran says, what are you saying? That the four of them are just supposed to deliver themselves into his hands, the heart and soul and guts of the free zone, so he can hang them on crosses and just walk in here next summer and kill everyone? I won't see my man sacrificed to your killer god. Fuck him. It's Stu's turn to be appalled at Fran's language, but Fran doesn't hear him. She says, killer god, killer god. Millions, maybe billions dead in the plague. Millions more afterward. We don't even know if the children will live. Isn't he done yet? Does it just have to go on and on until the earth belongs to the rats and the roaches? He's no god. He's a demon, and you're his witch. Ignoring Stu's protest, Fran tells him that she wants him to take her home. Not the hospital, but home. And then Mother Abigail takes a hold of Fran's wrist. When she lets go, all of Fran's pain is gone. No whiplash, no back pain. It's gone. But she tells Mother Abigail if this is a bribe from her God. He can give her back the pain. She would rather have it and keep Stu. But Mother Abigail tells her that God does not bribe. He just makes a sign and lets people take it as they will. Stu tells Fran to sit down and listen to what Mother Abigail has to say. Fran obeys, but she's shocked and unbelieving. So Mother Abigail explains to them, you are to go west. You are to take no food, no water. You are to go this very day, and in the clothes you stand up in. You are to go on foot. I am in the way of knowing that one of you will not reach your destination, but I don't know which one will be the one to fall. I am in the way of knowing that the rest will be taken before this man flag who is not a man at all, but a supernatural being. I don't know if it's God's will for you to defeat him. I don't know if it's God's will for you to ever see Boulder again. Those things are not for me to see. But he is in Las Vegas, and you must go there. And it is there you will make your stand. You will go, and you will not falter, because you have the everlasting arm of the Lord God of hosts to lean on. Yes, with God's help, you will stand. Glenn tells Mother Abigail that they'll be slaughtered by the first pickets they come to. Mother Abigail says, have you no eyes? You've just seen Fran healed of her affliction by God through me. Do you think his plan for you is to let you be shot and killed by the Dark Prince's least minion? She says that it's not her place to tell them, to convince them. But from Mother Abigail's mouth suddenly comes Glenn's voice repeating his words about the Dark Man how he's gathering the tools of technology against them, how he may be something more, something darker, how he no longer thinks sociology or psychology or any other ology will put a stop to him. Only white magic. This stuns and frightens everyone, and as Mother Abigail's voice is back to normal, she asks Glenn if that was true, or the words of a liar. They need to trust and obey the word of God. Larry wants to know if they have a choice. Of course they do. But this is what God wants of them. Ralph finally breaks the silence. If Mother Abigail says it's right, then he'll go. Larry agrees to go too. But before Glenn can say anything, Lucy, whom they've all forgotten about, (laughs) faints. At dawn, they sit around Larry's table. Fran enters to let them know that she thinks Mother Abigail is finally going. So they reconvene around her bed. Ralph was sure that something would happen at the end that would cause the wonder of God to stand before all of them, naked and revealed. She would be gone in a flash of light, taken, or they would see her spirit transfigured in radiance, leaving by the window and going up into the sky. But in the end, she simply died. Glenn finally says that he'll go, because Mother Abigail is right. Only white magic is left. Fran begs Stu to say no, but he thought of Arnett. 
of the old car carrying Charles de Campion and his load of death, crashing into Bill Habscombe's pumps like some wicked Pandora. He thought of Denninger and Dietz, and how he had begun to associate them in his mind with the smiling doctors who had lied and lied and lied to him and to his wife about her condition. And maybe they had lied to themselves as well. Most of all, he thought of Franny and of Mother Abigail saying, This is what God wants of you. He tells Fran that he has to go. She says he'll die, but Stu points out that if they don't go, they'll all die. They'll never be able to stop Flag otherwise. It's white magic or the power of God. And Stu tries to touch Fran, but she tells him not to. He's a dead man, a corpse, and she doesn't want him to touch her. Later, around 11 in the morning, Stu and Fran go up to Flagstaff Mountain. The picnic was Fran's idea, and she wonders how long it will take them to get to Las Vegas. Walking, Stu doesn't know, but if they can do 30 miles a day, they should get there by the 1st of October. Fran points out that this feels like a bet, like from the book of Job. The devil said, sure, he worships you. He's got it soft, but if you piss in his face long enough, he'll renounce you. So God took the wager, and God won. God always wins. God's a Boston Celtics fan, I bet. Stu agrees that maybe it is a bet, but it's their lives. The people in Boulder, Fran's baby. Fran points out that Mother Abigail couldn't even promise the baby would live. If she could have done that, then maybe it would have been a little easier for Fran to let Stu go. As it's nearing noon, they begin to pack up, but Fran asks Stu to make love to her first. On their way back, they stop at Baseline Road, at what had once been Ralph and Nick's house. Fran sees a patch of dried blood on the back steps, and she asks Stu if it could be Nick's blood. Obviously, Stu is uneasy, but says it could be. She tells him to put his hand on it and swear that he'll come back. Stu isn't sure how he can promise that, but Fran is insistent that God cannot run all of it. He has to swear. So Stu swears to try, and that has to be good enough. Stu tells Fran that he loves her, and she thinks maybe now she can say goodbye and let him go. They hold each other in the shattered backyard. In Chapter 60, later that day, Fran and Lucy watch the undramatic start of the quest from the steps of Larry's house. All men had changed into heavy walking shoes. They say goodbye, and Fran makes Stu remember what he swore. Kojak is joining the men on their journey, and Stu blows a kiss to Fran through his closed fist. And then the four men begin to walk away. At the end of the street, Stu and Larry turn to wave again, and then they're gone. Fran tells Lucy she wants some tea, and the two go inside, where they begin to wait. The four men move southwest during the afternoon. They're headed towards Golden, where they plan to camp for the night. For a moment, Stu had a feeling that all of them were on the verge of turning together and going back. Ahead of them was darkness and death. Behind them was a little warmth, a little love. Larry says, I feel like this is the end of everything. And Ralph agrees that's how it feels. But they continue on, and by nine o'clock that night, they're camped in Golden. Half a mile from there, Route 6 begins its twisting, turning course along Clear Creek and into the heart of the Rockies. None of them slept well that first night. Already they felt far from home and under the shadow of death. And those are the last two chapters of On the Border. We finally get some answers, you guys. We finally learn what it is that God had wanted from Mother Abigail and what he wants from the Free Zone. We learn that Fran survived the explosion, as did her baby. She did break her foot and experienced a sprained back when a couch fell on her at the end of the last chapter. Stu also survived. However, Nick Andros and Sue Stern both died in the explosion, along with Chad Norris and four other characters that we never really got to know. But we do learn that Teddy Wiesak dies later of his injuries from the explosion. And that kind of bothered me as well, because Teddy was the one who really befriended Harold, who accepted him, who called him Hawk. Um, and knowing that it was Harold's bomb that killed him is very upsetting. And I know, you know, Nick Andros is one of my favorite characters in this book. I was really disappointed when he died. But we also lost Sue, who I thought was quite a badass. Um, she was one of those stronger female characters, and she's gone now, too. But as Fran and Stu pointed out, things could have been so much worse if Mother Abigail hadn't returned when she did. 
I don't think her return was a coincidence. I think she came back to save their lives. The commotion that her return caused got people out of the house before the bomb. Unfortunately, it couldn't stop all of the casualties. And they know, obviously, that it was Harold and Nadine. And while they've been looking for the couple, Stu is pretty confident that they're long gone because Harold's not an idiot. (laughs) It makes sense that Fran would suddenly realize what the snipped wire and walkie-talkie box were for. And it makes sense that she would feel guilty about it, about not being able to put it all together, just like Larry. But I do agree with Stu that it was not her fault, and they couldn't have known what Harold was up to. Maybe they could have figured it out if they'd had time, but Flack tipped Nadine off to the fact that the committee had Harold's ledger. I really don't think that there was anything they could have done. It would have taken a while for them to put all the pieces together. And by then, Nadine had already planted the bomb. She already knew that they knew. She had to get Harold and get out of town. So I really don't think that there's anything they could have done. And I think Flag was protecting them, at least protecting Nadine, because who knows what would have happened if they would have been able to capture Nadine and Harold. But apparently that was not God's will. Mother Abigail had been helped by Leo to Lucy, and that's why Mother Abigail is now in Lucy and Larry's bed with an IV and near death. It seems that when she went into the wilderness, she really meant it. That was hardcore. She didn't have any real food. She's barely even a person anymore. Larry compares her to a mummy. With Mother Abigail back, Stu feels frightened, not of Mother Abigail herself, but of what she came back for, what she might have to say. And now the blinders are off in town and people are talking about flags, something that they probably should have been doing from the beginning. They've gathered outside of Larry's house, no doubt wanting to see Mother Abigail, or at least be told how she's doing and if she'll survive. Larry is dealing with his own guilt, not only from surviving the blast and coming away relatively untouched, but with his trust in Harold, how he had followed him across the country, deducing his instructions from candy wrappers and clever improvisations. Larry feels like he should have been able to figure it out, the same way Fran does. And he feels guilty about it, but he not only does he feel guilty about trusting Harold, but he feels guilty about surviving. Um, He thinks that it's old Larry triumphant all over again. He walks away unharmed while everybody else suffers around him. That's obviously nothing he can control, uh, whereas in his actions prior to the plague were his own actions, um, his decisions, his choices. But he could have died just as easily as Nick and Sue, and he didn't. And I think that's just a, you know, textbook case of survivor's guilt for him, especially as he's been trying to become a better man, not only for Lucy and Leo, but for himself. He also feels guilty about rejecting Nadine. If he hadn't, would any of this have happened? But he stayed true to himself and to his commitment to Lucy. And I don't think that he should be blamed for that. It's not his responsibility to take those choices away from Nadine. She wanted Larry to make love to her, to take away her choices to go to flag. Ultimately, they were her choices. It's not, you know, she put that on Larry and she blamed Larry for what was going to happen because he wouldn't make love to her. But this was all Nadine's choice. Maybe she was manipulated. Maybe she felt she didn't have any other option, but she had a choice and she made it. But the fact that Larry's feeling that weight on his shoulders just shows you some more evidence of his character growth. Because before he would have blamed everybody else, you know, he would have blamed Nadine, he would blame Harold um, for his choices, but he made the right choice this time and he feels guilt for it because he feels like he probably maybe could have saved other lives if he hadn't turned Nadine away. So for once, Larry is blaming himself where I don't think he should be. Ultimately, though, this was Flag. Flag was using you know, Harold and Nadine for his own means. He tempted, he manipulated. He's pulling the strings. And while the committee is sitting around trying to reform their society, Flag was using their own against them to destroy what they were building. So did the Free Zone Committee fail? Maybe they were just doing what they thought was right. They did send spies west, but Flag was moving much faster than they've been. The Free Zone Committee was putting off discussing Flag with the rest of the town. They were focused more on burial committees, power committees, law committees, law enforcement, and they were complacent. They got complacent. And obviously they knew the threat of the dark man was there. But I just think that the bomb is what 
was, I hate to say a needed catalyst in terms of being in the story, but as a reader, uh, I could see it definitely was a plot point, something that something needed to be done to shake things up, to get them off their asses and confront Flag. Otherwise, who knows? They probably would have just been sitting around through the winter doing nothing, waiting for Judge Ferris and Dana and Tom to return. So I just, I see why King wrote in the bomb. I see why uh, he needed to do that. And I am very upset that people I enjoyed in the book are dead, but it was necessary to get the rest of the committee on their asses and doing something about it. The Free Zone Committee in this chapter is definitely a different sort of atmosphere from the past meetings. Yes, people are angry. They don't want to deal with the agenda. They don't want to talk about committees. They want to talk about the dark man. They want to discuss the explosion and they want to discuss Nadine and Harold. Stu does his best to keep things in order. And in Stu's mind, no one cares that people have died. They've become something of a lynch mob instead. They just want vengeance. Some of them even want to vote on who to replace Nick and Susan with that night. I mean, two days after their deaths, they're ready to be replaced. Glenn's cynicism on the human race certainly seems to be more relevant now than ever, and they're supposed to be the good guys, but it feels like Stu is losing a bit of faith in the community. They do discuss Flag. They discuss what they know about him, what his plans may be. It's something that I think should have been discussed earlier, but as was mentioned, you know, people were still trying to recover from the plague, from their losses and grief. Jumping right into more doom and gloom may have scared people off, but now they're dealing with the consequences of not dealing with the issue fast enough. Glenn at least seems to know some of Flag's aliases. He knows what emotions Flag invokes in everyone. Glenn, the skeptic and the sociologist, seems to have accepted that this is a battle between the forces of good and evil. He's the one who's able to lure people from their shells to talk about their dreams. It's this large catharsis for everybody, and it's long overdue. And I kind of like how he views this meeting, um, getting people to talk about the nightmares, getting people to talk about the dark man. It starts to take away that fear. It starts to take away the power that flag ho- has over them. Um, you know, when you guys have a nightmare and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're terrified and you're scared, but then in the morning you think about it and it's kind of silly, right? Or you tell somebody about it. And as you're talking about it, it doesn't sound as bad as it was when you first woke up from that dream. And I kind of feel like that's what Glenn was trying to do here with these people, get them to talk about their dream, get them to talk about the dark man. And that takes away a lot of that terror. It ta- I mean, obviously the dark man is real. So the fear is there, but it takes away his power to control them in their, in their minds, to make them scared. And um, I think that this was a really good practice for the meeting, you know, a three hour long, you know, vent and discussion. And I think it was right for Glenn to walk away from this meeting, meeting feeling hope because now people are able to talk about this. They're able to put the fear behind them and look forward and be ready to battle flag if it comes down to it. Of course, um, I don't know how long (laughs) Glenn's hope is going to last because Mother Abigail wakes up and she wants to see him and the rest of the committee. We know that Mother Abigail is going to die, but first she tells the committee what's left of them, what God wants from them. Ralph, Larry, Stu, and Glenn are to go west to confront the dark man and try and defeat him. Mother Abigail has a list of rules. They can't go without water or food. They have to go wearing what they're wearing now. And I hope that none of them were wearing pajamas. (laughs) But why can't they take water or food? I mean, I guess maybe this is supposed to mimic Abigail's venture into the wilderness with nothing but the clothes on her back. I guess this could be seen as some kind of pilgrimage. But look at how well that worked out for her. (laughs) Anyway, she can't she can't say whether or not uh, Fran's baby will live or if they'll actually defeat Flag. So she's sending them on this journey without any promise that they're actually going to do what God wants them to do. God wants them to go west, but he won't say whether or not they'll actually succeed in defeating Flag. She does know that one will fall and not reach their destination, but she has no idea who that will be. Fran is understandably upset, and I can't say I disagree with her anger that, you know, Mother Abigail's God has already taken so much. So when will it end? Maybe Fran believes all of the harsh words she spews, but... 
Maybe it's just her fear of losing Stu that drives her, causing her to lash out. You can look at the parallels between Stu and Fran here because at the beginning of the chapter, it was Stu who is angry because Mother Abigail does whatever her God tells her to do. And that same God had killed his own son. Of course, that, you know, Fran was appalled by this and protested. And now Fran is the one calling him a killer God. And it's Stu who's appalled and protesting. So (laughs) I think that they both harbor some resentment towards Mother Abigail, or at least towards her God, that he is taking and taking. And when is it going to end? When will the sacrifices be over? Mother Abigail shows her own ability by touching Fran and ridding her of her physical pain from the explosion. Apparently, she has powers too, and maybe they're not as potent or as powerful as Flag, but God is working through her, wanting to earn the trust of those who remain. Mother Abigail thought Nick would be the one to lead them, but Nick has died, and so now it's going to be Stu. That makes me wonder if Stephen King had originally intended for, for Nick to lead everyone west to confront Flag. But when he hit a roadblock in his writing and opted to kill off some of the Free Zone members, instead, he just chose Nick. Because Nick was the obvious choice to lead the others, he was the heart of the committee. I feel like he was the heart of the entire book. It certainly felt like, at least from Mother Abigail's point of view earlier in the book, that Nick had a bigger role to play, that he was the one, he was the leader. Maybe his death is the catalyst that the, you know, that really drives their decision to accept Mother Abigail's request and go. I do believe that Nick would have agreed to go with little argument, sort of the way Ralph does, but I wonder what the end of the book might have been like had Nick not perished in the explosion. What if it had been Glenn, Stu, Larry, and Nick going west? I really don't know, but it's an interesting angle to kind of think about. This is a difficult request from Mother Abigail, and you know that they don't want to go. I mean, who would want to do this? They know that they're likely to die over there, just like the spies were. Will they defeat Randall Flagg before they do? Nobody knows but God, apparently. God, who also speaks through Mother Abigail, who uses Glenn's voice and Glenn's words to remind him that Flagg cannot be defeated by anything other than white magic. That was a bit unexpected and kind of creepy, especially as Mother Abigail can barely speak all of a sudden. Here she is with Glenn's voice in her mouth. What other magic do you need to convince you that this is God's will? Larry and Ralph agree to go before Mother Abigail dies, and Glenn and Stu decide to go after. And I know Fran is scared to lose Stu, especially not knowing if her baby will live or not. But Stu makes the right decision. He cannot stay only for Fran and the baby. Not if there's a chance that Flag will come over the mountains by spring and destroy everything. Sacrifices have to be made. Those four men will be the ones to make them. Fran and Stu are able to have a few hours to themselves, and Fran makes Stu swear on what she thinks is Nick's blood to come back to her. He does the right thing by swearing that he'll try, and then she's ready to let him go. Chapter 60 is extremely short. Fran and Lucy say goodbye to their men, and off they go with Kojak, heading west, and they're all feeling unsure. Larry thinks that this is the end of everything, and he's not wrong. The others feel it too. You can really feel their trepidation here because who knows what's waiting for them out west. Who will be the one to fall before they reach Vegas? Will any of them make it back to Boulder? And now Ralph, Stu, Larry, and Glenn are all headed in the same direction as Dana, Tom, and Judge Ferris. Speaking of Judge Ferris, we're going to catch up with him next week in Chapter 61. You guys, we are done with book two on the border. We're finished with the second part of The Stand. Chapter 61 will begin our journey through the last book of The Stand. And yes, the third part of the book is called The Stand. (laughs) It is the shortest part out of the three and things are going to move very quickly now. So if you've stuck it out with me this long, thank you. And we are so close to finishing this book. That's it for this chapter. And oh, I guess these two chapters. And that's it for this episode of The Circle Opens, you guys. Um, I can't believe we've got this far. It's been over a year and we're going to probably finish just somewhere around September. I don't, man, what a journey it's been. You guys have been amazing. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Have a great week. 
Stay safe, stay healthy, wear your masks out in public, please, and maintain proper social distancing. And M-O-O-N, that spells, see you next week. Bye.